Hey everybody, ABC 10 meteorologist Brendan Minchev here. We're going to talk drought. I know we haven't done one of these for a couple weeks, so we're going to update the very latest. Continues to improve. Almost no drought across the entire state of California. But most of this is going to be focused on the summer outlook for the state of California. What can we kind of expect as we look in towards June, July, and August. So let's jump right into it. The numbers for precipitation for the month of May, as you might expect, haven't had a lot of rain here in Sacramento just a couple days early on in the month where we saw some showers about three tenths of an inch. The average today is closer to eight tenths. So we are about half an inch below where we normally are. But the good news is season as a whole still above by about seven and a half inches. That should hold at this point, I would expect for the rest of the water year, especially if we can get just a couple of showers once we get towards September and kind of the start of the next rainy season. Taking a look at the drought monitor map itself, notice just how good not only California, but all of the Southwest looks a little worse down on the front range of New Mexico over here. Uh, but for the most part, we are doing very, very well in the Southwest. Uh, maybe Las Vegas, not quite uh, in that category as well. But let's look at the numbers now, specifically for California. 70% of the state in that gray color, that no coloring really, that's the base map. That's no drought at all whatsoever. Abnormally dry, technically not drought. That's recovering desert southwest, right? Or southeast, I suppose, of California. That's where we're still seeing uh, that, uh, that most of that abnormally dry and just a little bit up in far northern California as well. But technically, again, not drought. That's recovering drought. The only part of the state technically in drought, when we look at this, is that moderate drought, that kind of tan color, the 4.63% of the state also down in the deserts of Southern California right now. So drought has really basically been eliminated for all intents and purposes across California over the last several months of rain that we've had. Precip as a whole across the state, numbers are looking very good and still a lot of blue. Lots of areas still way above where we normally are to this point in the water year. And you can see that by all the numbers that we've got in the blue. This is departure from normal. This is not how much rain we've seen, but how much rain we've seen that is above the average for this time of year. And of course, at this point, as we start to work our way into summer, uh, we are no longer really in that rainy season. But our major water supply reservoirs, Shasta and Oroville, are looking so good right now. Shasta at 98% capacity, Oroville 97% capacity, and Folsom is even at 95% capacity right now. Maybe even more impressive is the snowpack, which continues to stick around. Look at these numbers here. In the central Sierra, in this blue color here, and then in this lighter blue color, the southern Sierra, there is still more than an average winter's worth of snowfall up in the Sierra, still to melt, still on the ground, more than an average years. That percent of April 1st average is still above 100%. So again, still more than an average year's worth of snow. That's how much snow that we've got and is still there in the Sierra, just under an average winter's worth of snow in the Northern Sierra. These average to date numbers look incredible, especially when you look at the Southern Sierra, 421% of that average to date. But really, if you wanna get into the, the kind of the nitty gritty, how much snow is there, that percent of that April 1st average is gonna give you a good idea of how much is there, which again, I'm saying again, because it's just that impressive still more than an average winter's worth of snow sitting in the central and southern Sierra. As we look at the month of May that we've had so far in Sacramento, we started off really below average, kind of chilly. In fact, the first several days were in the 60s. Even May 4th, we only got to 59 degrees for a high temperature. Then we climbed into the 70s, and then we just completely flipped the script, did a 180, 80s and 90s, even made it to 96 degrees, warmest day of the year in downtown Sacramento so far this year, May 13th, we did make it again to that 96 degrees. Then we were in those 80s and 90s for an extended period there, about two weeks, and then starting on the 23rd, just on Tuesday, we flipped that script yet again, and we went from the 90s down into the 70s. So we went from quite a bit above average to several degrees below average. In fact, most of these days, with the exception of yesterday, have been about 10 degrees below average for this time of year. But if you look at the departure from normal for high temperature, it's only about a degree and a half below where we normally are. The average high temperature for the month of May in downtown Sacramento has been 79.2 degrees. Normally, to this point, it's been 80.8 degrees. So the normal temperature, we're right there within it, right? We're not all that far below where we normally would be. It's only a degree and a half, and that's because really our cold temperatures have been several degrees below average, right? Several degrees below average. But the high temperatures have also been several degrees above average. So in a way, even though we've been quite cold and quite hot at times this month, it's as we look at the month as a whole, kind of the whole picture, 
it's kind of canceled itself out a little bit because we have been so extreme, both high and low for the month of May. Let's talk about the summer now. What can we expect as we look out over the next three months, right, over the next 90 days? Well, here's the forecast from the Climate Prediction Center. The 90-day outlook temperature-wise, this is for the month of June, July, and August, not individually, but for the whole picture over those next three months. Likely warmer across much of the United States from New England down to the southeast, across Texas, and then up over the western United States as a whole. Very likely warmer across portions of far west Texas into New Mexico and eastern Arizona as well. In California, leaning warmer, right? So not a, not a home run that we're definitely going to be warmer than average as we go through the summer months. But generally, it is expected that we'll be just a touch warmer, especially with El Nino developing out in the Pacific. When we look at precipitation, kind of about what you'd expect, right? Average precipitation, which means we're not going to see very much precipitation as we go over the next three months. While we'll be likely drier across the same portions of far west Texas, New Mexico, and eastern Arizona, while likely wetter across kind of the Ohio River Valley, parts of the Mississippi River Valley, and the Midwest as a whole, even down into the southeast potentially. So that's the Climate Pre Prediction Center's outlook for summer. Let's kind of break it down a little bit. Like I said, one of the reasons why uh, they're, they're kind of hinting at a lot of us being warmer than average is because of El Nino that we've got developing. And especially as we look just off the coast of Peru and Ecuador, look at that, that temperature anomaly warmer than average for this time of year and out over the equatorial Pacific, a little bit warmer than average as well. That El Nino is developing at this point. But when we look at California and the West Coast, look at the blue coloring, right? This is colder than average sea surface temperatures right now and that's helping to keep our afternoons cooler than average for the most part when we get that delta breeze developing that air has been sitting over this cooler than average ocean water and so it really just turns on that ac very quickly right that it's not like it's warm water blowing in to help cool us off this is colder water which is making that air colder so when again when that delta breeze develops that's actually a really cool air that's coming on in and just over the last several days uh, that's been a big reason of why we've been cooler than average. Uh, but with that water sticking around off the West Coast for June, at the very least, it's expected that it could help to keep us as a whole for the month of June, maybe a little cooler than average compared to what we might expect otherwise. A good way to look at this is by comparing to the summer of 2009 when we had a very similar setup. We were transitioning into an El Nino year. And as well, we had a really cool stretch of water just off the coast. And as we look at the temperature, the average high temperature ranks for the summer of 2009. This specifically is for June of 2009. You can see it was actually some of the coolest Junes we've had in parts of Northern California, especially down in Southern California, right? The number one would be the warmest we've ever had. And the number like 131 would be the coldest. But those numbers are in the hundreds, even the 90s. So for most of us, June 2009 was actually one of the cooler Junes that we've had on record. But when we look at the bigger picture for the entire summer of 2009, that's June, July, and August, now we can see parts saw, uh, parts saw a below average uh, summer as a whole, right? The desert of Southern California saw an above average summer for the most part as a whole, while most of us in the white coloring here means it was just a very average kind of summer. It wasn't too hot, wasn't too cold as a whole. Of course, we definitely had uh, you know those hot days those hotter than average days, those triple digits, doesn't mean we won't have it this summer and doesn't mean it didn't happen in 2009. Point is, it's a way to compare. We have a, had a similar setup in 2009 to what we have right now. So as we're trying to look out and think, what can we expect in summer of 2023? This is kind of one of those years that we can look back on and say, this is what happened. Not a, not a guarantee it'll, it'll happen, but it's what happened when we had the similar setup prior. As we look at the North American Multi-Model Ensemble, the NMME, for the month of July, you can kind of see that cooler than average temperatures sticking around, especially off the coast of Southern California and then Baja California as well, while those white colors are kind of average temperatures. That's for July. June, it looks very similar. When we look at August, now we can start to see that cooler waters being eroded away, those cooler temperatures being eroded away as well. Much warmer than average across much of the middle part of the United States, across the Great Plains, but also we start to see those orange colors working their way into California as well. That's for the month of August. When we look at the three month, right, the 90 day ensemble, this is for June, July, August, you can kind of see right near average in those white colors for California. But again, this is kind of what you'd expect, right? Warm across the central part of the United States, a little cooler off the coast of Baja. 
And when we compare that to the European model, uh, it's kind of the same deal, right? Near to above average for the European model. And then when we look at the, again, the NMME, the maps we just saw, uh, right near average. So what can we take away from this? It looks like it's going to be an average to near average summer. That's the bottom line, right? As we dig through all this data, as we look at the CPC map, everything is pointing to an average or a near average summer. Thankfully, it doesn't look like you know, parts of the desert southwest where it's in that kind of darker red color, even parts of the Pacific there, that would hint at a much above average summer. Uh, so thankfully, we're looking more closer to average. But I do want to say, though, with El Nino developing and as we look at the 10 hottest global years on record, not, not for California, but the globe as a whole, you can see they've all happened since the year 2010 and 2022, in fact, is right here. I, I know that uh, these temperatures here are in Celsius, but this is about two degrees warmer, uh, right? Now put on the El Nino. And you can see that when we have those El Nino years, they're definitely warmer as well. So maybe this year, 2023, maybe we get away with this year being a top three to top five warmest year on record. But I think with El Nino, they, they really tend to make these years bake, right? Uh, especially during the summer months for the northern and southern hemispheres, El Nino makes the globe bake. And so because we're transitioning into El Nino this year, maybe, again, we won't be number one or number two, but I think next summer with that El Nino sitting out there, we'll very likely have a number one or two warmest years on record. So there you go. That's your summer outlook for 2023. Uh, big thanks to our weather producer, Brody Adams, for helping to put all that together as well and digging through that data. Now, I want to talk a little bit, some, a little bit different now for the actual story that you're about to hear. This one takes place right here in the Sacramento area, down in Elk Grove, where we have what's called the Echo Water Project. This was a $2 billion water project that is really an investment in the future of water in California. Take a look. This is a perfect example of how we can build a climate resilient future for all Californians. This month, an aging piece of water infrastructure in Sacramento County was given new life. We are at the Echo Water Project, which is a wastewater treatment facility that treats over 130 million gallons per day of wastewater, really alleviating a lot of the strain on our delicate Delta ecosystem and capturing waters that would otherwise potentially harm that ecosystem and the ocean. Echo Water was a project that's now become this entire plant. Uh, we've essentially upgraded the plant. So it is, it is uh, generating a higher quality water. And that higher quality water not only protects the Delta ecosystem that we discharge to, but it's also enabled us to um, sort of springboard to another project that we call Harvest Water. And we're going to take this very high quality water, it's actually safe to uh, irrigate food crops with, and we're going to supply it, uh, sell it to farmers just south of here, and they'll be able to irrigate their crops with it. And that's a big deal. Many farms in the valley rely on groundwater to irrigate their crops. But by utilizing highly treated wastewater, essentially recovered water, groundwater pumping can be reduced or stopped altogether on ag lands serviced by what's known as harvest water. So harvest water, we're just in the process of getting ready to advertise for bids. There's actually six different projects that will all be built. Uh, pump, there's a pump station and then various pipeline projects. Um, so that will start probably kick off uh, the end of this year and then uh, we hope to have water flowing in 2025. Unfortunately, we have a lot of depleted groundwater resources across our state. The drought and overpumping has caused a lot of that over time. Fortunately, because of the wet weather that we had and the snowpack that we had, we actually have a really critical opportunity to be able to recharge some of that groundwater through the melting of that snowpack and through leveraging some of the wet weather that we received over the winter. And there was a time when you could have a lot of single-use facilities. You know, you'd have flood facilities to fight for flood times. You'd create storage for, for drinking water or ag water purposes. You have a, a wastewater treatment plant, and that's just treating you know, waste. Now we're, we're really connecting the drops across our watersheds. Whether we are talking about reservoirs, floodplains, or water treatment facilities, it seems that multi-purpose is the name of the game when it comes to combating a changing climate.
This is a good example of why we need to move away from a way of thinking about protecting water and ecosystem in a way that would harm infrastructure and harm economies. This is really going to help our economy thrive. It's going to help deliver water to the agricultural sector and stimulate agricultural production, help build our climate resilience for droughts that we know are coming, while really leveraging some of the wet weather that we have and treating wastewater that would otherwise harm the ecosystem. But it's important to note that this project was not cheap. It came with a hefty price tag of about $1.7 billion. And when you factor in the costs of the Harvest Water Project as well, you get a checkout total of over $2 billion. Funding came from a 2014 state water bond vote known as Prop 1, which authorized $7.5 billion for water quality, supply, and infrastructure improvements. Of that, Echo Water got $290 million, as well as a $1.4 billion low-interest loan from the State Water Board. I think it's really important uh, to recognize, and this is something that we're really proud of, that this project was originally estimated to be uh, $1.5 to $2.1 billion in construction costs. And we were able to bring the project in under budget and on schedule. And a project of that magnitude um, to, to come in uh, that way is, is very impressive and, and so we're really proud of that and proud of our ability to protect our, our ratepayers. One of the things that helped w were the loans that we got from the, the state and federal government. Uh, the, the interest rates were very low so that allowed us to actually save a half a billion dollars in interest alone. Um, we were also able to build a pilot project on the plant site, so a mini plant here at the plant, and, and we're able to combine different technologies and then find out whether those different technologies could meet the permit requirement that we had. And then of those, which is the cheapest, you know, which made the most sense to, to the ratepayer. And so by doing that, we we're also able to save several hundred million dollars in uh, selecting a technology that was relatively cheap. So yeah, they're no longer single purpose. We're asking a lot of these facilities, um, but that's why the investment is there. The billion dollars that the board has been able to provide keeps this work affordable, it means that ratepayers aren't paying higher bills than they would otherwise. And so between the regulatory side to help, you know, kind of frame up what these facilities can be, because they're permitted by a lot of our agencies, all the way to the funding side. Yeah, we're really kind of proud of it and know that, you know, we're moving away from that single, single source, single use sort of facility of the past. So it's expensive, but, you know, this is really going to help California as well, right? Definitely. Yeah, it's, uh, you, the, re the reality is uh, we're in a moment we're going to have to invest a lot into our systems, our water systems particularly because of climate change, the pressures that it's putting onto our systems. And so, um, yes, you know, the price tags, especially for like water recycling goals in the state um, or, you know, it, it, advancing this sort of uh, uh, work at wastewater treatment plants is going to come with a high price tag, but also comes with huge benefits on the back end. And they're benefits that will last for the decades ahead, especially those climate reducing, uh, climate gas reducing benefits. Uh, they're, they're helping to contribute what you know, we, we all know is a, a huge lift and making water uh, cheaper because we're using it smarter. But this investment isn't just in water either. It's in people. These are jobs. Uh, the, the investments that are happening right now in our communities, in especially the water sector, are jobs. They're, they're union uh, paying jobs. They're, 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 they're jobs that um, you know, come with pensions and, and a lot of support and, and ultimately incredibly rewarding. Uh, you, you talk about uh, having you know, a connection to, to something that um, is really impacting all of us in the water sector continues to be that. So we need more people. We don't have enough. Come, come on in. Start, start working at uh, facilities like this. We're looking to invest and create jobs. Jobs and investments that will have far-reaching impacts all across California. I would say we're all directly impacted by this. The Delta serves the vast majority of Californians, in fact. Um, and so whenever we're alleviating some of the pressure on this ecosystem and source of water supply for the state, we all can feel that impact. That means that we can rest assured that there are supplies to deliver drinking water to communities. That means that um, you know we're looking at ways to improve water delivery for agricultural production and other economies at the local and regional level all across the state.